October 19th of 1994. We're at Kaiser Mead plant located in Spokane, Washington to complete job analysis. Should you have any questions regarding these job analyses, please feel free to contact our offices at area code 509-328-1880. These job analyses are being completed by Alan L. Stacy, Senior Vocational Consultant for Star Rehabilitation Services. Analysis will be for the position of security guard, which involves some first responder uh, duties. This is the clock house at the front of Kaiser Mead. This is approximately 300 yards from the uh, parking areas. Guards in this area may be required to respond to fire emergency situations carrying fire extinguishers weighing 35 to 40 pounds. Office area from the guardhouse, as you can see, guards have video monitors to watch. Be able to keep an eye on delivery vehicles coming in and out of the area. Verify that all the authorized personnel get in and out of the gate structures. There's a sign and book they monitor, provide uh, hard hats and safety glasses for uh, visiting personnel. The clock house is the entry point for all the Kaiser employees. The monitors that you see here are in the parking lots. Should a problem arise, a uh, security guard would have to travel three to 400 yards to the parking lot and deal with the hazards. The phones are here. Uh, this, Dwayne, this is the, also the answering point for the plant, right? So if a general call comes in, they route it down through the plant. Okay, so the guards have to be able to use a multi-line phone deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Now you've got, uh, I see a parking lot control panel down there. Um, the just controls gates outside. Okay, and the guards have to use radios. And I see cellular phone there. And telephones, okay. Uh, what is the usual shifts that the guards run? Uh, well, oh, don't worry about it. Shift, don't it's, worry uh, about it. They swing at graveyard rotating. Okay, so it's like a seven to three. Yeah, uh, yeah, usually about seven to four. We've got okay. A half hour overtime in each shift. And the uh, okay, okay. Well, half hour overtime each shift. The guards so get a break, on your left. Uh, uh, or what so which you would call a schedule left. break or yeah, for lunch and stuff. Really. So they, they eat their lunch right in the same area and right. they stay in the same area right. all day. Right. Okay. That's what the half hour extra time is for each day for catch up on uh, shift change work, log work, log books. And uh, the uh, agreement was because we didn't get that half hour scheduled break, it was agreed to that we worked a half hour extra overtime each day to compensate for that. In the event of a fire or a medical emergency situation, mm -hmm. uh, say we're down in the pot rooms, would, would a guard respond? Yes. Okay, at that point, is there somebody that comes in and, and provides relief for him? No. So you do a lockdown of the gates? Right. Or, okay. And the guards, the requirements to be a guard, they have to have an EM, the medical background? Well, no, no it's not required, but it's something we look at when we're screening. Okay. Uh, we do try to get medical training for those that we choose to become guards. Uh, at least basic first aid training, and we're working on it now to get them up to at least first responder. All right, and your first responder uh, completed a JA of that before. They basically would respond anywhere in the plant, yes. uh, accomplishing extraction if necessary uh, of individuals. Assisting. Assisting with yeah. extraction. Uh, we use uh, outside resources right now for doing heavy rescue. And, uh, the guard basically is just kind of the eyes and ears. Uh, to the incoming responders. Okay. Is this the only guard on sh day shift right now? Well, myself, but I'm the fire inspector. And okay. We're the same, kind of back up each other. So. All right. Yeah, but day shift's the only one where we have dual coverage here. Okay. To 
see a problem, mm -hmm. uh, such as uh, somebody breaking into cars, what would be the procedure? Would it be to call the sheriff's department, I assume, first, right. since we're, we're in the county here? Right. Then would they go out to that area? No. Uh, seal the parking lot uh, and keep the camera on the person. Uh, we don't approach people. Uh, yeah, truck. We don't approach people uh, alone. We're not armed, and we we don't uh, we don't approach uh, those individuals without uh, sheriff's back. Okay. Uh, are the guards required uh, to restrain or detain individuals no. at all? No. No, we don't have power of arrest. We're not uh, licensed at all. So the heaviest thing that, that they would be involved at is carrying a fire extinguisher as right. we wait over, the, over there. That plus uh, if you have to uh, lift uh, patients in the ambulance okay. and on a stretcher. What were we saying? escort somebody out the only time. For unauthorized personnel in the area? Or? Well, yeah. Okay. That would be the only thing. And then somebody coming in that's not allowing the plan. Uh, we get once in a while we'll get somebody like that, an off shift employee that might come out here disgruntled. Uh, Check strange people for camera passes. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have a real strict policy on cameras allowed in the plant. Okay. These guys yeah. in the plant, so if one of the larger workers gets hurt, I've seen individuals in this plant yeah. up around three hundred pounds. Oh, yeah. Uh and they got hurt, they had to be loaded in, the guards would assist. Mm -hmm. Okay, when they're driving the, the scooters and stuff around, are they carrying any of the, uh, anything with them? Uh, I know at once in a while, the meal, meals get delivered here too. Are the meals picked up here? Uh, well, yeah, we don't deliver meals. We used to a long time ago. Okay. But uh, we don't do that anymore. This is, uh, uh, people have their time cards and their uh, lunch cards and come down on overtime and we sign out. Uh, uh, meal cards for them to get money now, so people buy their food out of the machine. Um, <laughs> can we go take a look at the fire truck oh, and sure. the real line? You bet. Okay. Thanks. You bet. The uh, guards would be used to respond with. Uh, when these were weighed, uh, they weighed 35 to 40 pounds full. So they would have to be carried uh, to the emergency situation and uh, utilized. So this would mean uh, walking with this sort of weight on. Okay, can we take a look at the, oh, go ahead. This is the fire truck yeah. here that they would, that they would drive in, in an emergency response situation. The real line you said was one inch? It's a one inch hose with uh, 200 feet. And you're saying that charged roughly uh, would be about, about 100 pounds on the full length. How often during a year have you, on an average, have you used this? Oh boy. I'd say average probably 10 times. Really? Yeah. So uh, it, uh, a little less than once a month it's used, yeah. uh, hypothetically. Okay. Uh, once in a while we'll get a dumpster fire, a trash can fire, uh, or we'll get uh, some hot uh, coke and pitch burn on a landing that we can't reach with a fire extinguisher, so we've got to log water up there with a straight stream okay. to get the, the reach that we need. So there are times when not the whole line will be pulled, but a portion of it. A portion of it to, to put yeah. out fires. Okay. Yeah. I see that there's Plus the... the training You've got the fire axes and everything. Uh, if if the guard is responding and, and necessary, would he be trained to use these as well? Yeah, we, we go. We teach everybody uh, full firefighting uh, capabilities: ladders, holes, uh, forcible entry. Uh, but we, because we respond by ourselves, we're not to get involved in that without that. So. So a lot of that you leave to the county fire right. departments. But because um, we are doing a fire service and. This is classified as a Class B pumper. It has to carry the same equipment as the Class B fire protection pumper. Mm -hmm. 
Does this have power steering? No. It's manual steering? Well, it does, but it's kind of down right now. Okay. So so it's, it does have power steering on it, but it, it's not working. Sometimes okay. it does, sometimes it don't. We have to add fluid to it, and it's on the list to get fixed. So. <laughs> One of those lefts are priority. What year is this? Is this like uh, 1969. It's about where I guessed it to 4, be. 4,000 miles. Wow. All right, Dwayne, is there anything else that the the security guards would be required to do that you could think of? Uh, um, as far as physical... Physical or duties that are essential that are done on a daily basis? Uh, that pretty much covers the daily duty task. Okay. Once in a while, we might be involved in uh, helping one of the office people with a package. Okay, so they may have to carry or some packages. A box weighing uh, maybe up to 45 pounds okay. uh, at, at maximum. So with the exception of the real line, the heaviest thing, uh, real line in patients, which is a, is a very seldom, uh, less than once a month we're talking about here, uh, the heaviest thing that they, they could get exposed to on a, a usual basis would be about 45 to 50 pounds. But like I said, you know, the heaviest thing that we look for when we're uh, uh, screening people is to uh, see what their capabilities are because of the patient weight ratio. Okay. Uh, there may be a time when they're required to lift a person that's 180, 180 200, 200 pounds, pounds. And they'll be at one end of that, you know, sharing half that load. Uh, and so we want people that are... Physically capable physically to do the job in an emergency situation. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we're drilling locks. Uh, also, the this is my area. This is your area. It's not yeah. the security guard's requirement. No. Okay. No, that's my job. That's would my the would the security guard drive the ambulance yes. too? Yes. So this can be one of the duties. You can see the stretcher and basic uh, first aid equipment, oxygen. I assume there's portable oxygen? Yeah. Okay. And it uh, weighs about 15 pounds. 15 pound pack, yeah. okay. You're, it's radio equipped. Power steering. Power steering on this one. I imagine this gets used a little more than the fire truck? Uh, no, not actually. We don't transport patients over the road, so therefore, uh, most patients that we deal with in the ambulance are just uh, those that are unable to walk to medical. Okay. Uh, we kind of changed our status a little bit, but from time to time during day shift, if we have a severe uh, leg injury or something that requires a person to get on the stretcher, then it requires the nurse and the guard to both go down together. Okay. Uh, on the off shifts, if we have a problem, we dial 911 and we use outside ambulance. Outside ambulance services. Because oh. of our requirements for this that are limited and uh, you know as we are today and this is how it works um, that may change in the future uh, but the way we respond now is that this will uh, just be used on day shift all right <clears throat> the stretcher once you get the patient on the stretcher it's basically a one-man operation because it's a self-loading self-loading yeah, yeah. See, the, see the self-loading capability yeah. on it so once you get the front wheels on the guy at the back and push the levers and mm. probably about 60, 70 pounds of push there to get this thing up and over. And secure. Okay. All right, that pretty much completes the guard's requirement. The, the responder is the heaviest part of the job is what right. I'm hearing. The right emergency. Right the emergency response situation. And be <coughs> prepared. Well, I got a frog in my throat. Okay, thank you, Duane. You bet. Sometimes we have uh, spare fire extinguishers like these brand new ones that we keep on shelves, and that require a little heavy lifting. Oh, about different. the same size as the ones that we... A little less. These are 25 pounds. 25 pounders. Uh, but because of their heights and their the little different uh, ergonomic, uh, uh, I guess, requirements because of, you know, possibility of back strain or shoulder strain. Um, 
we don't usually keep our new fire extinguishers on the floor because uh, from time to time it seems that uh, if someone gets in here you know on the off shift that needs uh, a replacement they'll grab a new one rather than one that's charged one that's charged and we keep those kind of out of sight so that we can replace them in new construction and things like that okay and try to keep ahead of the game so <laughs> all right thank you very much for You're your welcome. time the scooters used by the security guards that would respond and this is the vehicle as you can see, they would need to drive vehicles, respond to emergency situations, deal with people, may have to escort people off the premises, and complete work. This completes the job analysis for security guards. For department, this is some of the new equipment online. Steve, you want to explain what, what a worker would do during a shift or when he's dealing with this piece of equipment here? Okay, this equipment is, uh, has been installed to clean our crucibles took out an old piece of equipment. Um, it works on both the tapping crucible and the transport crucible. Uh, an employee will, uh, the hot metal carrier driver will deliver the, the tapping crucibles to the room and then they'll also occasionally have a transport crucible to clean. They take a new strong back device with the crane and they engage the crucible strong back has a motor and it turns the crucible upside down. The crucible is then set on the, the table, you know, the yellow table, um, and clamped down. At that point, the, uh, the milling machine cleans the inside of the crucible, essentially, and all of the cleaned material goes down into the basement and is collected in the skip. Uh, okay. The reverse of the operation then gets the crucible off of the cleaner and set back down upright on the floor. Okay, so when the cruise is being connected, uh, flipped upside down to the clamps there, I see some large wrenches. So a worker would have to get up on the platform. I saw a couple of steps. There's uh, four steps to get up on there. Um, they would use the wrench to tighten down the bolts on the cruise. Now, I see a bar over there. Is that bar to align the clamps on the left-hand side? Um, the bar is just to, uh, it's just a cheater bar to put on the end of a wrench to, to get some more to help torque to it get down. Some more torque. Uh, okay. Basically, uh, for normal operation, uh, the employee doesn't have to get up on the table. He's got a foot switch to where he can, the table rotates and he, okay. Can, okay. he can bring the bolts around to him as he stands on the floor. Now, the, the only time he's got to get up onto the table is either to do cleanup work or to uh, change or rotate the teeth on the milling head. And at that time, he locks out the equipment. Uh, about, about how long does it take from the time you start hooking a cruise up to the time it's cleaned and back off? Ballpark figure. Uh, about 20 minutes. About 20 minutes, okay. And how many, is this done on a fairly regular basis or is this one man every, assignment? Every day, every shift. Every 20, day, every shift. Hours a day. Okay. So how, how many cruises will it clean in a shift? Ball, ball, again, ballpark. We clean six uh, tapping crucibles and have the ability to clean a, a transport crucible as, as well in that eight hour period. In the eight hour period. Okay, I see a transport crucible over there. Uh, these, these are the ones right here for cleanup that are yeah, going to clean now. The foreground are the tapping crucibles. Okay. Be cleaned on this shift, and if they have time or the need, they'll clean a transport crucible as well. Okay. The the worker once he's got it hooked up, is he the one that also operates the control panel in front of us here? Yes. Okay. Um, so he has to have some training yes. and background. What would you say is the heaviest physical demand of this part of this job? Would it be tightening the bolts down? Yeah. There's really not too much to it. Um, everything is either done with the crane or by the uh, by the cleaner and the cleaner's PLC controlled. About the only thing he has to do is uh, um, that, that's at all manual is, is to tighten down the tighten down the bolt. That, to, is there the a torque down. specification on no, the bolts? No. Just snug. In fact, yeah, the crucible, the weight of the crucible itself will hold it hold it in place, place. for the most part. But we do go ahead and, and clamp it down just to just to be sure that it it doesn't move around. Are you going to be cleaning any here? It should soon? be this morning. Yeah. Okay, I'd like to get uh, get some shots of that too. Okay so that we can get the get the guy hooking them up. Okay, I'd like to go out and take a look at that wrench a little closer and weigh it, if you don't mind. Okay. okay. 
switches uh, on the milling machine. This job has effectively eliminated the uh, cruise cleaning position that was previously noted at job analysis done approximately 18 months ago. The wrenches in front of you, the one on the right weighs seven pounds, so the one on the left weighs uh, eight pounds. The foot operation control for the decking is in front of us here. It is operated with a lockout system. The table that you see in front is a movable table, rotates at five RPM. The milling head, which goes up and down in the cruise, rotates at 120 RPM. So there is exposure to moving equipment and machinery. When taking a cruise, as you see here, to, this, to be clean, all the loose material that can be removed by hand is removed by hand, put in the skip. The material is then put, on, put over the Grizzly and dumped so that what loose material can be put in there. Now, worker is also required, according to Steve, to go up and down these stairs. We'll go down the stairs now and take a look at the skip area uh, for operation fiscal demands. The uh, lower area, there's 24 steps. You can see there's a handrail assembly to hang on to. The grade is not severe enough for a worker to be concerned about. There's good footing. There is some exposure to dust down here. This is the scale. Okay, these are the chutes that come off of the, that, that would be the grizzly there, and that would be the, uh, be the cleaner. So I see a ladder here. Do they have to climb up? No, that's for maintenance. That's strictly, any, any okay. Maintenance work done on the, the equipment. Since the cruise cleaner is part of the metal transport department now, is this a rotating job also? Yeah. Okay, so uh, how often, say, would a guy work this job if he was part of the metal transport department? Uh, anywhere from every day to once a month, okay. or not at all. I, I remember the rotation schedule was a little unusual out uh, here, so... See, any, uh, the, there's eight metal transporters, and they have uh, the opportunity by seniority to pick which job they'd like to do. Okay. So... Is this, do, is this one the workers like to do? It usually goes either second to last or, or last. Okay. Well, this is kind of slick. Now, oh, they use the crane to remove the right. crane to remove the skip here. It's on a DLC controlled cart that takes it over to to the area below for, the hole for removal. And the crane will. Okay, I see a sledgehammer there. Uh, what would the sledgehammer? I sledgehammer a pry bar. What do they use that for? Just nothing in particular. Nothing in particular. Okay. You can see that this would be the PLC track here. Moving the equipment out so the overhead crane can remove it. So there is exposure to uh, moving machinery, um, dust exposure. Now, would the worker down here also have to sweep and clean up the area? Yes. Okay, so you'd be using a broom. Uh, it appears there may be some occasional use for a sledgehammer and a pry bar. A pry bars are 25 pounds, sledge is approximately 20 pounds. Um, I see some additional ladders. Do they, do they use the ladders for anything? Uh, it's again maintenance. These are all maintenance, okay. And what about the uh, the stand there? Is that again maintenance? Yeah, or? Yeah. Okay, so all of that is maintenance. Basically, the guy comes down here, he, you know, will move the container, clean up the loose area, anything else? Okay. This, yeah. Ventilation. Ventilation down here. Okay. Is this a respirator mandatory area down here? Okay. Uh, safety equipment, steel toes, any other requirements? Bump cap. Okay, just standard safety equipment. Okay. gasket on first. Okay. And they'll flap this uh, uh, reusable gasket over the top and then they'll button down their patch cover. What that does is when they get over to Trentwood all they have to do is slide this out of the way and uh -huh. they've got fume containment with the large gasket. Oh okay. So and yeah. they pour the tank off at Trentwood this gasket flaps up out of the way and when they set it upright again after it's empty it pulls it back down eliminating the 
the uh, dust and fume exposure. So when you're change, when you you don't you must not have to change your hatches often with this new system, like they used to. Well, they occasionally do. Yeah, there's quite a difference here in the way in this. I'm impressed. You can see the temporary gasket we put into place. These uh, transport containers will be taken over to the Trentwood plant for pour off. This, uh, there's two containers mounted on an 18 wheeler. This is part of the metal transport department. You can see them tightening them down. So you've got upper body motion, you've got manual and manual dexterity, grasping, pushing, pulling. This truck is now full and ready to transport. Again, you can see some of the changes that have been made down here. We'll move over to the TAC system next. Now the truck will go to that TAC system. Yeah. Okay. You see the driver is moving the vehicle. The lights or the coating tells him where to align the truck and get it into place. Yeah, I know. You see the truck is now aligned. Now the main hatch cover will be handled. Once this truck is done, uh, the truck will then go to the Trentwood plant. This is operated by an operator using joystick control. You can see the joysticks in the control panels sort of like operating a big video game. It's done at waist level. We'll go inside the control panel here. A large video game, huh? Yeah. <laughs> can I, I slide by here? So sure. Once I get operation. You can see the operation on the truck is being controlled by the operator. All the moves coincide to the equipment. Again, Steve, you said this was called TAC, right. and that stood for what? Treatment of aluminum and crucibles. Treatment of aluminum and crucibles. So basically, as they're mixing, they're injecting. They're injecting a solid flux that produces uh, alkaline impurities. Okay. The work is typically done at the cast house in the furnace. That's where the, the name comes from. This is treatment of aluminum and crucibles. Um, it eliminates the need for either a fluorine or a, a solid either a gaseous or a salt flux in the in the casting furnace. Uh, essentially the metal arrives at the casting furnaces with the purity and purity is already reduced. Okay. Now the gentleman here that's operating the controls, this is primarily what he does all day, is that correct? Well no, he's he's the uh, he's in the metal transporter job description. Uh, he took the over the road truck driver job today. Okay. But then 
that job description, the over-the-road truck driver uh, treats his own crucibles. Treats his own crucibles. So each driver will treat his own tanks. Okay. When you um, take the lids off, I assume that the uh, temperature of the metal isn't affected, adversely affected? No, not. Uh, we probably lose maybe 50, 50 degrees, 50 to 100 degrees throughout the whole process. That's not bad. It's just a matter of putting in uh, uh, a cold rotor and some, some cold material. There's only about 10, 12 pounds of, of uh, uh, flux material that goes into into the tank, so we don't lose a lot of temperature. Okay. Holly, what are the what are you watching here? Is this this is a fluoride? This gauge here shows fluoride going in. It'll come up on here pretty soon. This will mix it down. Okay. And then when that gets up to proper time, there's a post mix time to take the exhaust off for the fumes. All right. One goes three minutes in, one hundred and twenty seconds. At 300 seconds a minute. You can see on this side it's been modified. Um, the fumes are being drawn into the dust collection system. Yeah. There's yeah, a bag yeah. out, outside the building. I have seen that since they cut that pipe off. I haven't either. Just the, they did it. They finished the job yesterday. So there's no exposure to fumes during this process at all? Well, there have been in the past. We've had to make some modifications to reduce or eventually eliminate that exposure. So safety on this position has been strengthened by by the introduction of this equipment. Um, frankly, it has uh, it has increased the exposure to fluoride in this particular building. Well, oh, has it really? We've got some work to do to uh, get get that exposure uh, captured. Um, so, what it has done but it's not a respirator mandatory area, or, or no, we've done testing and the, the work we've been able to do. Uh, we've had some testing that was, that was uh, over limits, uh, so we, we did some work, uh, put in some engineering controls that brought, brought the, the uh, fluoride levels back down within the limits, and we'll continue to monitor okay. and make sure that we're... Physically, one, one of the things, the, the driver of each rig, he gets out of his rig, he comes up, he opens up his own uh, transport cruises, um, when the cruises are filled, he seals them off. He again moves his truck to the stage by lights, as you indicated. Comes up here to the TAC, mixes the equipment. So he's basically going up and downstairs, getting in and out of his truck. And then once they're once he's done here, and they're resealed again. And again, the resealing is done by the machinery. Then he'll take the truck to Trentwood. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. You will occasionally have to change these gaskets. The with the gaskets on the oh the on the gasket on the on the lid. The, okay. The and that's just a matter of slipping them off of the off of the prongs and uh, slipping a new one on. Fairly simple. Okay. And that would be done at that height where it is now. Yes. Okay, so that would be working overhead height uh, on an occasional or to seven basis. You could actually basis. drop it if you cared to, but yeah, you'd do that at that height. Okay. Oh, I see the, the, the control on the lid handle. All right. They'll also at this point take a sample out of the tank and prepare the sample and then introduce it into the spectrometer. The spectrometer is completely robotic control. Now, how's the sample taken? Is it? He's got uh, a, a long-handled, uh, probably a five or six foot long-handled uh, ladle. Okay. And he goes to the edge of the. Oh, the railing the here. Rail there and has plenty of plenty of uh, length to, to do the job. So they'd be bending over. They'd be reaching with the ladle. Reaching with the ladle. Removing the molten metal. Um, what approximately how much is in each sample? Uh, the ladle holds probably uh, a cup. Okay, so approximately eight ounces of metal. And then it's poured into the, he pours it into the spectra analysis machine? Right. Well, mm -hmm. no, he pours it into a sample mold. Sample mold. And it allows okay. it to freeze and then, and then uh, puts that frozen sample into the, into the lab. 
Alright. Stop it here for a minute. Used after the sample is taken. The molding block weighs 12 pounds. Once the uh, metal is poured into the mold, it's taken out, the sprue is cut off with a bolt cutter, as you can see here, which is cammed and compound. You can see the ladles here. remove his test samples. As you can see, he transported the 12-pound mold, ingot mold, over to the tank. You can see him reaching and dipping the sample at this time. He'll break through the basic slag and try and get into pure metal. You see that there is uh, hazard to fluoride uh, exposure here. Once the metal is poured, he'll do this with both tanks. You get a better representation on this one. He's now got his sample. Takes it out, cools the sample, so he can put it through the sprue cutter. He'll cut, cut the core sample off. Now these samples are tested for consistency and it will be put into the spectra analysis. These drivers have to have a CDL for since they're driving an 18-wheel vehicle and would be responsible for over-the-road requirements. You can see now is to cap <laughs> tanks. Uh, Hand-eye coordination, judgment, uh, driving skills, manual and finger dexterity, fine motor coordination are requirements of his job, judgment skills. reaching at shoulder height. That is molten aluminum, I believe in 938 degrees centigrade. The metal must frost and cool. It is then removed. It cools very quickly. Molten metal cools quick enough, however, you still must handle it uh, carefully. The second sample is taken from the other pot and again put through the spectra analysis. So, operating machinery in correct order, uh, understanding complex uh, requirements. being able to accomplish uh, and program basic information. You can see this is a key keyboard. It allows for coding and keying for entering samples and identification numbers. Notice the locks on these. These lids must be tightened down enough that the materials can be transported at approximately 16 miles across the uh, city of Spokane on city and county roads to the Trentwood plant. We will accompany one of the drivers across town to get a better idea. You can see that these are a 18 wheel tractor trailer rig. Drivers uh, metal transporters would have to climb in and out of their vehicles. Depending upon seniority and which jobs they take for the day, workers may have to drive a metal transport rig such as this, picking up uh, metal cruises that are full from the lines 
Uh, they can accomplish one of several jobs. There are eight metal transporters in this department. Uh, these are seniority and bid positions. We're down in the lower area here. You can see that uh, truck number 747 is uh, almost loaded and ready to go. Note the stairs down to the work area. Drive, drivers have to climb up and down the uh, into the cabs. These are a manual shift truck. Use of mirrors, average driving skills and visibility are required. So good judgment entering and exiting. You can see that this is a fairly narrow uh, confine following the green, amber, and red lights. They'll accomplish the staging. Into the uh, staging area here shortly. Notice the vibration in this truck. <laughs> Return to the metal transport area. See the staging lights. job analysis for the metal transport truck driver over the road. We're at the shot casting area. As you can see, this is the furnace. The furnace operator shot casting machine is up. The operator monitors the flow of the metal into the shot casting machine. Exposure to heat, high noise, walking up and down stairs, verifying operation of the equipment. Operation. Bars are used to move the uh, shot around. The shot goes down through a water screening system to a liquid, cools it, trigger. The shot is then taken to the conveyor belt through uh, a film setup. Note the operational control for this position. Again, samples are taken from the metal to verify consistency. Also 
a problem. I'm standing approximately 14 feet from the, from the metal coming out by the heat of radiating to this point. Tipping down sledgehammers, you can see in front. here where the metal would be scraped, the impurities scraped back. This is the other side of the shot casting furnace. As you can see, there are various houses and cables to be used for lifting skips or materials, air hoses, and other overhead crane setup be brought in to remove skips or pulse. The shot goes up to the drying zone operation. Along the drying zone here. The conveyor belt. And where the end product is deposited. Because it requires to keep the shot free and moving. Samples must be taken every so often. Hazards in this area consist of metal shot just on the floor as it falls out of the kiln to the conveyor belt. This metal shot is round, approximately a uh, quarter inch in average diameter. As the shot comes out of the kiln, it is warm, so heat is a factor. Corrugated stairs are uh, throughout the plant. So climbing the stairs is part of the operation process. Tools such as this lake, which is approximately 15 pounds. I use the uh, uh, lake the uh, materials into the skip. You can see the screens up above are sorting the various sizes of the metal. Workers would have to be aware of moving machinery. There is access to both sides of the belt via the con underneath the conveyors. However, there is low headroom and clearance. Areas must be swept and cleaned on an ongoing basis. Casting operation operate a forklift with a large rake. The rake 
various size metal as the bin fills up. This is a general overview of the shop casting area completed at Kaiser Mead in Spokane, Washington on Wednesday, October 19th of 1994. This is Alan L. Stacey, Senior Vocational Consultant, completing the job analysis of this workstation. Should you have any questions regarding the physical demands of the job analysis provided on this tape, please feel free to review the written information that accompanies each video shot on this date. Should you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact our offices at area code 509-328-1880. This is Alan L. Stacy, Senior Vocational Consultant, completing the job analysis. Thank you for your attention.